of Community Board 10. Um, we've had a lot of odds and end mishaps today, so we're actually calling this our April Fool's meeting. <laughs> and um, we'll start the meeting with the honor of the pledge. I'm sorry. You <laughs> I'm sorry. I knew he was here. Where is he? It's a, uh, we always have a bio. Sometimes they're two pages. Uh, yeah, I, I <laughs> and, uh, I want you to meet uh, Battalion Chief Brian Duffy um, from Battalion 42. He is a 25-year veteran of the FDNY, a native son of Brooklyn and Bay Ridge. Bay Ridge uh, for my first 33 years. Okay. Uh, the okay. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, he now resides in Staten Island with his wife and daughters, and he's a dedicated public servant, and we welcome you, and we thank you. Oh, thank you. The Fire Department is a very important part of our community. Thank you. Thank you. I pledge allegiance. Thank you. It's always glad, always glad to be here. Whatever you guys need, I'm always available. Thank you. Wait a moment. Wait, wait, wait. We just have a photo op. Is it? No, I'm not leaving. I'm no, just here. Let us have a photo op. Oh, no. There's a card where we are. Okay, um, we're, we don't have a quorum yet, so we are going to move ahead with the public session. At the is, is there anybody who didn't in, on, the, on, the, on the committee, on the board, who has not signed in? Susan, did you sign in? Did Susan sign in? No, I signed in now. Okay, I think, then I think we've got it. Yeah, it's done. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. So we have a quorum. We can we can no, no, no. So we can move on with the agenda. Um, can I ask for a motion to adopt the agenda? Joe Soglowski, thank you, thank you. Adoption of the minutes of the March 18th meeting, Larry Stelter and Shirley Chen. Thank you. And now we'll move on to the public session. We always have busy meetings, so we ask the members of the public session to try to keep their comments to one minute. And we'll start with Lisa Ferrara from the uh, New York, from the Brooklyn Public Library, followed by Susan Francis from Alice at Park. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lisa Ferrara, and I'm from Fort Hamilton Library. I'm here to tell you about some interesting programs and events that are happening in the next few weeks. Our library will be hosting a program with magician Joe the Magic Man on Wednesday, April 24th at 2 p.m. He uses live animals and performs for all ages. Our location will also be hosting a folk concert with Judy Gorman on the same day, Wednesday, April 24th at 6.30 p.m. And last but certainly not least, our library is having a puzzle project for adults on Friday, April 26th at 10 a.m. So if you want to donate a puzzle or work on a puzzle, please stop by. For more information, please visit www.bklynlibrary.org. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Susan Francis. I'm with the Owl's Head Park Volunteers. We're going to have two greenups coming up in May. They're going to be Saturday, May 4th, and Saturday, May 11th. These are from 10 a.m. to 12 noon. All are welcome to join us. We do a lot of gardening. We do a lot of yard work. So dressed in 
clothing, you could get dirty. Totally fine. Then we're going to have Viking Fest. That is going to be, everybody take this down, Saturday, May 18. We're going to have a table. The Owls Head Park volunteers are going to have a table. We're going to have free arts and crafts, and I'm making it for any age. And then lastly, you're going to hear a presentation from Sanitation on Make Compost. They're giving away free compost in this area. Owls Head Park Day is going to be Saturday, April 27, from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m., and you could get 40-pound bags of compost. This is really good if you have a tree bed, if you have gardens. They're really good because they give nutrients to the soil, and I'm afraid that's why we're losing a lot of our trees. So compost is not a bad thing. If you get a chance, get yourself a free bag. And before we uh, move on with the rest of the public session, I do acknowledge some of our guests. We have Devin Morales representing Assemblywoman Matilda Frontis. Welcome. Victoria Mazzola representing Assemblyman Peter Abadi. Thank you. Uh, we have Nick Chamberis representing uh, Nicole Nuitakis. Jessica Callow representing Borough President Adams. Michael Sheldon representing. Um, Assemblyman, uh, Councilman Brandon, I'm having a trouble with it. Be Michael is not a small guy, and he keeps disappearing in the room today. It's a, <laughs> I don't know. And we have Colonel Zisner, Zisner from Fort Hamilton Army Garrison, and Amanda Hay, the new Chief Public Affairs Officer of the Fort Hamilton Army Garrison. Welcome, welcome to our community and our board. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, and then our uh, next speaker is Baruch Bloom from the Department of Sanitation about organics recycling. Hello, I'm uh, Baruch Bloom from DSMY. So uh, you heard about our event coming up on April 27th. There will actually also be a community meeting this Thursday, um, which is more in-depth and you can learn uh, get an inside look at how DSNY is taking your food scraps and yard waste and turning them into compost. So we want to hear about your experiences with the program and how you're using the brown bin and any feedback. Uh, we're also looking for volunteers in our campaign. So if you know any, if you have any affiliations or if you know anyone who would be interested to come to this community meeting, it'll be this Thursday, April 18th, 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. at Bay Ridge Library Community Room, 7223 Ridge Boulevard. And you can register at makecompostbayridgelibrary.eventbrite.com. Um, we actually also have some compost here. So I will be here until the end of when you're talking about the DSNY meeting from last, from Wednesday. So we have one. I see some familiar faces. Um, so before then, if you want to grab any compost or some usable bags, we have those. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us, sir. And then we have June Johnson and Ned Burke. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this week, the Narrows Botanic Gardens had their, their meeting of the board of directors, of which I'm a member. And the president, Linda Dahl, asked me to bring some literature, which I did, explaining what the what the what happens every week and all year long at the garden. Narrows Botanic Gardens is often called the jewel of Bay Ridge. It's four and a half acres, which extends from 69th Street to 72nd Street along Shore Road. On the weekends, it's great to bring the children into the area where, they, where you could see the turtles. They have the largest collection of turtles in the whole city as well as koi fish and five beehives. There isn't really any place in our neighborhood where you could go down and really have a really great day seeing things that you don't see in the city. Their plant sale is May 11th. They have five movies during the summer. October 13th is the Harvest Festival where they have the canine uh, costume. Uh, party, contest, it's really great. The kids can paint p pumpkins, it's really a nice day. If you're looking for something great to do, please go down to Narrows Botanic Gardens and enjoy yourself, you'll have a wonderful time. Thank you.
Good evening. Uh, my name is Ned Burke. I'm the new editor. I just started at the Brooklyn Eagle. Um, I really just wanted to come down and introduce myself to the board and, and the community um, and tell you a little bit about some of the things going on at the Eagle. Uh, we are uh, probably in uh, uh, a state of expansion right now that is probably unparalleled in local media, at least in the city, in terms of investment. Uh, we're hiring new reporters. We're growing. And my goal there, my mission there is to be covering all of Brooklyn, the people, the powers, and the ideas shaping Brooklyn. Uh, as you might know, we have Megan McGoldrick here who's been covering uh, this area for uh, the Home Reporter and the Brooklyn Reporter and, home and uh, Spectator. Um, they will continue to be covering it. Uh, it'll continue to be operating uh, independently from the Eagle. It'll continue to give you your hyperlocal neighborhood news. Uh, but the Eagle is focused on those bigger borough-wide stories. Um, and I'd love to hear it from you. I'd love to tell you a little bit. Uh, we have been covering the BQE and the renovation plan. I don't know if any of you are aware of this. They're going to be tearing down uh, the cantilever section by uh, Brooklyn Heights. And that's going to affect anyone who lives along the BQE, anyone who drives in New York City, really, uh, and anyone who buys anything that was transported by a truck. Um, we've been covering the industry city rezoning, the expansion of Brooklyn's jail, um, TPT, the crisis of housing theft in the city, uh, sometimes by the city, um, and also some of the ideas that have been percolating in Brooklyn, including just last week we broke a story about a councilman who is pushing a uh, one that you might be interested in, um, a proposal to reduce community board influence in bike lane decisions. Um, so, but I'm not really here to tell you about these stories. I want to hear from you what the stories are. Um, so feel free to come up to me after the meeting. I'll be here uh, as long as I can. And you can also find us at brooklyneagle.com. Sign up for our newsletter at brooklyneagle slash subscribe. Um, are there any questions? Am I allowed to take questions? OK, cool. Well, I'm going to ask for one little indulgence. I am trying to make it to every community board in Brooklyn, and I'm taking a selfie up here. It's weird, um, but I'm doing it because I want to surround myself in my office uh, with these photos to always remind myself who I work for. So smile or look angry. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Thank you and welcome. Um, now, we, uh, I'd like to ask up Chris Thomas from Hamilton Walk, followed by Devin Morales. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Thomas. I live on Hamilton Walk, which probably most of you don't know where it is. It's on 94th Street between 3rd and 4th Avenue. Several of my neighbors are here. There's Hamilton Walk and Lafayette Walk on 94th. They are small little sidewalks that have, um, there's no street access. They're just houses that go perpendicular to the main street. Um, the homeowner on the corner, um, 94th and Fort Hamilton, uh, Hamilton, Hamilton Walk, uh, which is 331 94th Street, um, is trying to put in a little driveway on the corner. We wanted to show that the board was aware. Um, we've been working with Josephine, with uh, Councilman Brannon's office. Um, we believe this is an illegal driveway that they're trying to put in. Um, it's uh, unsafe for the families on the walk. Um, we believe it is um, unattractive to the walk itself. We believe it will bring down our property values while raising this one homeowner, uh, homeowner's property value. Um, and it's something that we wanted to make sure that everyone was aware of because it's affecting um, not just us, but also Lafayette Walk. Um, if someone on the corner wanted to do the same thing, um, and we wanted to make sure you guys could help us out. I just want to add um, what Chris is saying, that we got a call last week from a board member um, who told us that a street light um, on 94th Street was being relocated to accommodate a accessory parking space. Um, and I reached out to Councilman Brandon's office and they had already been working on it. Um, they did not have the proper permits to move the street light. They did not have the proper 
permits to install an accessory parking pad, which is adjacent to an easement that is for pedestrian use only. Um, so at this point, the Department of Buildings has issued a notice to revoke the permit that was a modification of a driveway, which didn't exist. So that was submitted um, not forthrightly, not honestly. And the Department of Transportation has um, was on scene and the street light uh, relocation did not take place because there were not proper permits and there was no proper Department of Buildings permit. So I want to commend Chris and the neighbors here and, and thank Councilman Brannon um, really for the hard work on this and we will continue to monitor this and stay in touch with you should there be any changes um, and any new applications that are submitted. So I just want to thank Chris and I wanted to let the board know. Michael? The Department of Transportation, no, I'm sorry. A contractor, um, Hellman, I think it is, um, was a contractor that was hired and retained by the owner at an exorbitant cost. Um, the problem was there's a series of requirements at DOT. If you have a construction project, there is a procedure to move a street light for um, a construction project, whether it's a new, you know, uh, a new building that, that might have a new driveway, you can move it. It's, an, it's a cost to, I think, upwards of $20,000. Um, but they did not have the sign off from DOT. Okay. Thank what you. No. <laughs> and I know there are a few, there, there are more people here from the area. We thank you for coming, and uh, the board will do what they can to help you with this issue. Thank you. And with Devin Morales. Hello. I am Devin Morales. I am the constituent liaison for Assemblywoman Matilde Frentis. We represent the 46th district. So thank you for having me. Wanted to let you know that we are excited that uh, her district office has opened up here in Bay Ridge at the end of February. We are at 8525 3rd Avenue, and we are there to serve you from Wednesday to Friday. Um, I want to let you know of a couple of events coming up. Um, Assemblywoman Frentis is hosting a Bay Ridge Community Thrive Talk at the Fort Hamilton Public Library this Wednesday. Um, that's April 17th. It is from 6 to 7.45. Um, some of you might know Thrive is the initiative that New York State has to kind of open up a conversation about mental health, the stigma behind mental health, and to offer some resources and tools that the state has to um, help you uh, help yourself or help loved ones navigate mental illness. Um, I also invite everybody to stop by and see us at the office and bring your new and gently used books. We are hosting a book drive on behalf of Grandma Loves. Um, they are doing, um, they're starting a program this summer where they're going to have a bookmobile driving through Southland and doing um, story time and puppet shows and going to be giving away uh, free books to children in the community. Um, and last, I uh, wanted to share that assembly member Prentice is super proud that she was able to secure a hundred thousand dollars New York State budget for uh, the Bay Ridge Center so we're super excited that we'll get to help all the amazing work that they continue to do in the community for our seniors um, if anyone has any questions you can see me after the meeting thank you thank you very much Jessica Jessica Callow filed out Michael Shelton Hello everyone, my name is Jessica, I'm from the Borough President's Office. Um, I left our monthly message in the back. Um, I just want to highlight, we have a career transition fair happening at Borough Hall on April 16th. Oh, that's tomorrow. So th that's a cool thing to attend. It's during the day, so it's from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. So if, you're, if you are interested in that for your grandkids or your kids or your ne niece or nephew, uh, you're more than welcome to go to that. And then we have, um, in partnership with the Center. Um, May 7th, we have our senior tech event at Borough Hall. So that's pretty cool. They're going to be showcasing all new technology happening there. So, and how to work with it friendly wise. Okay, anyone else have any questions? I'm always on the side or in the back. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, Michael Sheldon from Councilman Justin Brannon's office. Uh, just a quick announcement, the councilman was just named the chair of the new committee on a resiliency and waterfronts in uh, the city council. Uh, so that's a big deal. It's a huge responsibility as our city continues to uh, contend with the effect of climate change. Uh, we're excited to expand the focus beyond just lower Manhattan for all that 
Augusta. So to that end, we'll be holding hearings in all five boroughs. Uh, and then the other quick thing is just uh, the council is in the, uh, the middle of budget season and uh, Councilman Brandon's fighting tooth and nail to bring as much funding back to our district as he possibly can. Um, so yeah, that's it for me. Uh, I'm here if anyone has any questions. Thank you, and then we'll have Nick Chambaris representing Assemblywoman Meliotakis, Joan Clips. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I'm Nicholas Chambers here on behalf of Assemblymember Nicole Malitakis. Uh, before I say anything, I just want to um, express how heartbreaking the events at Notre Dame are today. So many people all over the world, regardless of religious views, are, are deeply saddened. S such beauty and, and, and grandeur for everyone. Um, all of those who are affected, including the first responders, are in our thoughts and prayers. And we look forward to the cathedral being restored uh, to its, its beauty and splendor very soon. <clears throat> uh, Susan Francis and a rep representative from the Department of Sanitation already mentioned it. Uh, really excited about the compost program. There are two meetings this week. Uh, Nicole had a meeting with DSNY today and, and discussed this program and is really excited um, for ideas in using our office to promote the initiative. It, it's a really great idea. I encourage you to come to the meetings. As, as everyone said, the flyers are already in the back. Uh, I didn't need to put any up. There were plenty. Um, Lastly, we want to discuss transit. As you know, for about nine years now, I've been discussing the unreliability of the R train, uh, what a terrible bur burden it is. Not only is it now a terrible burden, but it's also increasingly unsafe. Without getting into many specifics about recent events, uh, just last week, someone uh, committed loot accident in front, of in front of one passenger stalked around the train. There have been stabbings, assaults, um, and reports of harassment on this train. Nicole sent a letter to the, MT, uh, the president of New York City Transit, Andy Byford, uh, really asking him to take into account these new developments. They're startling. You know, we, we've all taken the train. I don't have access to all the statistics, but you know, th there's been a rash of incidents. And Nicole has asked Mr. Byford to work with law enforcement to set up a plan um, and just basically hold the transit authority accountable. Thank you very much for your time. Good evening. My name is Joan Clips, and I'm a homeowner <clears throat> living on 88th Street between Battery Avenue and Parrot Place. Our car has been hit twice, once by a school bus, once by two cars that collided on the intersection of 88th Street and Battery Avenue in February. And the collision was so great that it pushed into our car and caused damage. It's been parked in the same spot there for these two accidents on 88th, on the 86th Street side of 88th, and on the Battery Avenue side, very close to Battery Avenue. Now, I believe that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I would like to see a traffic light put there. The stop signs don't seem to deter these cars that are coming fast off the Belt Parkway, uh, wherever. And um, what happened with the school bus was interesting because a neighbor, Michael Kennedy, observed it. And he copied down the, na the number of the school bus. And we traced it. And we've seen that school bus and others trying to make a turn down 88th, going towards 7th. The street is too narrow for school buses. And I would really like to see a traffic light that would uh, alert drivers Thank you. to Thank at least you. We, stop. We will, we will discuss the issue with the DOT. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And that is the end of the public session. Thank you all for coming and for your comments. Um, good evening. Today is tax day. But I ask you, what other events occur occurred on this date in history? I know of two, and I'll see if you know them by the end of the meeting. Um, last month, I very firmly expressed my concern 
that Community Board 10, with 353 acres of diverse parkland, has not had a parks manager since May 2018. I thank Councilman Brannon to reaching out to the Parks Department. However, we will not have a new parks manager until May if we're lucky. The district office hosts quarterly district cabinet meetings. This brings together senior representatives from all city agencies. It is helpful to the district office and it is important it is an important venue to have agencies address issues jointly. Mm -hmm. I have attended three of the last four meetings, and at the most recent meeting, representatives of the Parks Enforcement Police were present. But at the three meetings that I attended, there was no management reputation from the Department of Parks. Their treatment of Community Board 10 is not acceptable. On a positive parks note, I want to thank Bay Ridge Cares and State Senator Gonardas for their recent park cleanup, and thanks to all of our local parks volunteers. Volunteers are the backbone of the Parks Network. I would like to congratulate Councilman Brannon on his appointment as chair of the New York City Council's Committee on Resilience and Waterfronts. He said, we are a city of waterfronts, and of the five boroughs, four of them are islands. Brooklyn is one of those. And I would like to remind our councilman that for as long as I have been on the board, and probably longer, the number one item on our community board capital expenses is the rebuilding of the seawall at Shore Road. We, we see the, right over there, we see the seawall as a protection of the pedestrian pass and, pass and the bicycle pass, but is also a protection of the Bell Parkway. Councilman, please try to address this issue before it is a crisis. <clears throat> at the most recent Brooklyn Borough Board meeting, the MTA, discussed their new Omni fair payment system, which will be a card swiping program, something like a credit card that you'll swipe. Within the next two years, Metro cards will be phased out. They will replace, be replaced by a scanning system. Scanners have been installed at stations on the IRT Lexington Avenue line from Grand Central Station to the Barclay Center and on all Staten Island buses to test the program. During this test period, Passengers' free transfers will not be available from the subway to the bus if they use the scanning technology. So if you know anyone who uses the Brooklyn bus, the Staten Island bus, and transfers in Brooklyn, tell them to stick with the MetroCard till they do the conversion. When fully operational, operational riders will be able to pay for the new Omni cards in a variety of ways. One will be similar to Easy Pass payments. It will be possible for riders to buy and refill cards at stations and to buy prepaid cards at real ro local retail spaces. I suggest that we have a presentation on the program. Community Board 10 uh, of particularly needs to address the concern of seniors and the sa disabled because they'll need to know what, where to buy this thing and that the, if, they, if they are not able to go up and down the stairs, they won't be able to purchase the cards at the stations. We'll, we'll be hearing more about that. Um, I think some of you are familiar with the book and, and I think it was a movie or a TV, so Tuesdays with Maury. In the last month, I have had Fridays with Josephine. District Manor Beckman, Josephine, and I attended a presentation by the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey on the Port Master Plan. This is a 30-year plan to address the growth of cargo in and around our area. The Port Authority expect container volumes to double or triple by 2015. Increased freight into New York Harbor means increased trucks. We see this already with the increased volume at the 65th Street Rail Yard and also at the increased activity at the Southboro Marine Terminal, which is near 39th Street. And the increased uh, activity at the Red Hook Marine Terminal at Columbia and Sackett Streets. Much of this increased activity includes cars, recently imported cars, lumber, windmills, uh, produce from Central and South America, and clothing. There is a change in this distri distribution process. Historically, distribution centers have been uh, at low density, low cost areas. Um, but, for, but they have found with increased transportation costs, with fuel and um, tolls and labor costs, that it is more cost effective to 
locate distribution centers where the distribution will take place in highly populated areas. So we'll be seeing more distribution centers in our immediate area, which will mean more trucks. Uh, when they brought this up, I pointed out that there is no direct highway access from all the centers that the Port Authority was discussing. So that will leave trucks exiting and entering these facilities on our local streets. And this will have a detrimental interest, impact on Southwest Brooklyn. Uh, the director of the Red Hook Terminal discussed a, a proposal to site cargo transfer stations similar to our garbage marine transfer stations. So instead of having all of the trucks come into Brooklyn and leave by trail, they would segregate them and they, they would have a barge go to Manhattan, a barge go to Queens, and a barge go to Bronx, uh, the Bronx, which would reduce truck traffic in our community. Um, and as the waterfronts of Manhattan, Northern Brooklyn, and Queens have been deindustrialized, the major impact on increased contract container traffic seems to fall to Southwest Brooklyn. I ask all of our elected officials to explore this cargo transfer proposal and other options pr to protect Southwest Brooklyn. Many, many Brooklyn community boards were invited to this proposal. Only Josephine and Dara showed up. And it was very interesting and impressive. I mean, it shows the direction of traffic, traffic activity in our, in our community and how it will impact us. My second Friday with Josephine was the second Dyke Lights meeting of 2019. Thank you, Councilman Brennan, for taking the lead on this issue. As you know, the district office has been working on this nightmare for several years. There were multiple meetings in the fall of 2018. Nothing improved. New ideas are introduced that seem promising, and then nothing changes. At each meeting, DM Beckman does a PowerPoint, PowerPoint presentation of conditions in Diker Heights during the Christmas season. It is awful. The images are awful, not the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> The most disturbing slide shows firefighters walking because their truck cannot get through congested streets. Fortunately for that event, this was not a serious incident. But in an emergency, seconds make a difference between life and death. If there is a medical emergency, if a resident with no history of asthma has an asthma attack because an illegal food trunk is belching toxic fumes into their home and emergency workers cannot get there, it will be a tragedy. When you look at the conditions in this area, this is not if a tragedy occurs, it is when the tragedy occurs. The district office and the councilman are working diligently on this, but city agencies of New York do not seem to understand the gravity of the situation. When a tragedy occurs during dike lights, the responsibility will fall on the administration of the city of New York. Tonight, I announce the formation of the nominating committee for the next year for Community Board 10. Judy Grimaldi will chair the committee, and she will be joined by Tracy Britton Pitcher, Ann Falunco, Ruth Greenberg Mazur, and Dean Rossini. Thank you. And enough for me. And on those two questions, on April 15th, Abraham Lincoln died and the Titanic sank. Okay. That's all. Thank you. That's all. Good evening, board members. So there is a great deal of work taking place in the district, and if anyone drove down Fort Hamilton Parkway, you could see that national grid work continues throughout the district, um, both local law 30 work as well as major replacements of, of gas line infrastructure. In addition, the New York State Department of Transportation notified the district office that they will begin resurfacing the 92nd Street overpass above the Golden Expressway between Gatling Place and Dahlgren Place starting today, April 15th, approximately the 17th. One travel lane in each direction will be maintained during construction. This partial roadway closure is needed to facilitate repairs on road surface as part of a $28 million bridge maintenance project. The district office, along with Councilman Justin Brannan, requested the New York State DOT engineers once again inspect the Fort Hamilton Parkway overpass is forming large cave-ins and potholes along the joints of the bridge. 
and thank you to all board members who brought this to our immediate attention. And New York City DOT will be filling in those potholes until a larger plan is formed to address the underlying infrastructure issue there. The Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority um, emailed us also last week to let us know that the Verrazano Narrows Bridge Belt Parkway ramp into the Belt Parkway eastbound will be paved starting tonight at 10 p.m. through 5 a.m. and Tuesday and Wednesday nights as well. This roadway surface operation will require a lane closure on the off ramp from the bridge and onto the Belt Parkway eastbound. One lane will also be maintained from the bridge to the Belt Parkway, but motorists may expect delays and should plan additional travel time. So this work is extremely weather dependent and may require additional nights the week of April 22nd. Starting tomorrow, April 16th, more work um, will commence in Community District 10. The project involves the installation of new 8-inch and 12-inch water mains between 76th Street and 80th Street from 10th to 12th Avenue, 10th Avenue from 77th Street to 80th Street, and 11th Avenue from the mid-block of Bay Ridge Parkway and 76th Street to the mid-block of 81st Street. So a lot of this work came as a result of resident complaints about poor water pressure on a few blocks um, in Diker Heights. So as much as it's going to be a messy um, time for those residents, it is a much needed water main replacement um, job. So the initial phase of this work will include saw cutting that is expected to begin tomorrow. Also, as many of you know, the DDC sidewalk contract is in effect in CB10. Work on sidewalks that have been violated in the past um, is, are the locations where work will be taking place. This has generated many, many calls to the district office. Um, the sidewalk contract comes around to community districts every five to seven years. So it's been some time, and um, in addition to the sidewalk contract, there is also a pedestrian rampart project that is continuing in our board. So many of you have seen corners being refurbished. Um, it was part of an um, Americans with Disabilities Act um, lawsuit that um, was settled by the DOT. So um, a lot of that work is taking place, and we are getting generating a lot of calls to the district office. The Senior Issues Housing, Health, and Welfare Committee will be hosting a senior resource fair on Tuesday, April 30th from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. right here at the Fort Hamilton Senior Center. So tonight I am making an appeal to any board members who are able to volunteer that day to help us. Any time you have, small or great, would be really appreciated. Um, please give a call or an email and we will provide you with an assignment based on your availability. I also have posters here. These beautiful posters that we made into the office. If any of you, anyone has free time um, and walks the avenue of our commercial strips and wants to hang them up at your favorite places that you patronize, that would also be helpful to getting out the word. Um, the community board filed a street event permit for the curb lane outside to accommodate both a shred truck, um, which will be there from, from, let's see, 12 to 2, as well as the uh, MTA will be bringing its Metro card van. So if you're a senior and need a, a Metro card um, or a new one that has a photo, you can come anytime between 11 and 3, and there'll be a host of agencies and elected officials setting up tables. Um, so it's a good resource for our seniors, but the event has grown exponentially, so we do um, need some help, or Dorothy and I will be out for the rest of the week exhausted. So we appreciate any help you could give us. And I have some few announcements. Sunday, May 5th is the Five Borough Bike Tour. So we have this map and all of the streets that will be affected in Board 10 on our website, and we will also do an email blast about that as we get closer to the event. On Sunday, May 19th is the Norwegian Day Parade. The parade steps off at 80th Street and 3rd Avenue and turns right at Bay Ridge Avenue to go up 5th Avenue. And, sun and Monday, May 27th, I I'll mention again, next month is the Memorial Day Parade, and the parameters of that event will also be on our website. The next general board meeting of Community Board 10 will take place on Monday, May 20th at the Knights of Columbus, 1305 86th Street. Respectfully submitted. Thank you. And I will tell you, a huge amount of effort has gone into the preparation for the senior fair. I really thank the district office for all of their efforts. Thank you. And now, the treasurer's report. Thank 
Doris, good evening everybody. Community Board 10's Treasurer's Report as of March 31st, 2019. Total personal services, $167,629.22. Total other than uh, personal services, uh, $20,060.16, leaving an un unencumbered budget balance of $96,221.62. Thank you. And now we'll move on to committee reports. Um, unfortunately, um, Environmental Committee Chair Nick Nicolacos could not make tonight's meeting, so I will give a report and a recap of the meeting. On Wednesday, October, uh, April 10th, the Enmar Environmental Committee co-sponsored an outreach event with the Department of Sanitation. The district office did extensive outreach to promote this event. DSNY is calling this campaign, Make Compost, Not Trash, and you got a hint of it earlier. The goal of these meetings is to open a dialogue with area residents to encourage organic recycling, identify issues or suggestions to improve participation, and to create a new volunteer outreach effort within Community Board 10. The event was very successful, and the Environmental Committee will be meeting in the future to discuss ongoing ways to support in this effort. If any board members were not able to attend last week's meeting, there will be another opportunity this week as DSNY is holding an event Thursday, April 18th from 5.30 to 7.30 at the Bay Ridge Library, Ridge Boulevard and 73rd Street, respectfully submitted. Um, it was a very interesting presentation. Um, we have had organic recycling in Community Board 10 for quite a few years now. And they're trying to improve for, uh, participation, and they wanted to know, they wanted input from us. It was really a workshop to say, what works, what would make it better, how, how can we learn more? And I, excuse, uh, Richard Day was there, and he was, uh, he was a special project. He is in charge of outreach to um, large apartment buildings to encourage users there. Um, they're also planning to have four drop-off centers in Bay Ridge. Right. Where there are places, in the, you can go to Union Square Park and drop off your garbage. At, uh, and I know people who do that. At uh, you know, community board, former board, uh, ten member does it. Um, but it would be convenient if you live in an apartment building and you don't have access to um, organic recycling, if you could drop it off at a place. And I think one of the things that came up, it would be encourage recycling if people really knew how it worked because they saw more from beginning to end. Like, you're seeing your compost there, which really helps. Um, many, several of us went to the metal and plastic recycling, and we saw how that works. There is, a, you know, because you read things in the news that recycling doesn't work. Well, that might be true in other areas, but strangely, it does work in New York City. And I think the Department of Sanitation's goal is to make it more effective. And I ask you all to find out more and do more. Is there a, a link? Uh, uh, we did a workshop and there were comments. Is there a link where people can put comments online? Um, not currently, no. Okay, okay. So thank you, it uh, respectfully submitted. And now we will move on to traffic and transportation. Good evening. The membership of the Traffic and Transportation Committee met on Monday, April 1st at 7 p.m. at PS 170. The first item on our agenda was an update from the DOT on the public comments and ideas submitted at the January Bike Lanes Workshop. This is an informational report. To review, Bike lanes were first installed in Community Board 10 in 2003 and expanded in 2015. In 2018, DOT made a recommendation to bring a north-south connector on 92nd Street, which was met with community disapproval. In an effort to work with our community and get more input, a workshop was held in January 2019, and on April 1, 2019, the DOT shared a review of the outcome of that workshop with our Traffic and Transportation Committee. 
The January meeting had over 70 participants who used all types of modalities of transportation. The DOT website was also open for additional comment. At the meeting, tables discussed the destinations where people would want to ride their bikes. This included going to parks, shopping, getting to school, getting to other neighborhoods, and also just commuting to work. Community concerns included safety issues such as double parking, truck loading, traffic congestion, bus routes, and bike lane conflicts, enforcement of traffic law, and the need for more traffic education. At the workshop, the creation of north-south routes were discussed, such as direct routes along the avenues and access to Sunset Park and other neighborhoods to the north. The suggestions for east-west routes included access to commercial areas and easier Gowanus Expressway crossings. Requests for improved neighborhood crossings besides to the Gowanus included short parkway, improvements to Coney Island, and also along Polly Place. Both committee members and residents urged the DOT to consider the safety for all modes of transportation including walking, biking, and driving. For their next steps, the DOT will be reviewing the feedback and re return with a proposal for new bike routes. The next item was a presentation by DOT for a school safety traffic calming plan on 7th Avenue from 65th to 84th Street. 7th Avenue southbound is an important local truck route along the expressway. It is an area used by students crossing to several schools on either side of the highway. And between 2012 and 2016, there were two pedestrian fatalities, two school-age pedestrian injuries, and one school-age bicyclist bicyclist injured in this project area. The crash data from 2012 to 2016 actually included 160 total injuries of 20 pedestrians, eight cyclists, and 132 motor vehicle occupants. DOT presented that the existing wide roadway on 7th Avenue is part of the problem and encourages speeding. On this wider roadway, speed has been recorded at 50 miles per hour. 61% of the drivers are above the 30 mile per hour speed limit between 7th Avenue and Bay Ridge Parkway, and 82% are above 30 miles per hour at 7th Avenue and Fort Hamilton Parkway. Between 65th and 84th Streets, there is a very high volume of student pedestrians going to Bay Ridge Christian Academy, the Lutheran Elementary School, PS 170, PS IS 30, IS 259, St. Ephraim, St. Anselm's, PS 127, and several pre-K centers. Existing conditions include the failure to yield, including particular trouble spots at 67th Street, Ovington Avenue and Bay Ridge Parkway. So what are we going to do? The first proposal to address this is to reduce the speed limit to 25 miles per hour from 67th to 79th streets and to reconfigure the roadway to reduce speed. This will include a proposed protected area for cyclists and there will be no loss of parking spaces to achieve this. There will be a parking lane, two driving lanes, a buffer, and, and two-way protected bike lanes next to the side of the highway from 67th to 79th Streets. Next, at 7th Avenue and Ovington, and also at 7th Avenue and Bay Ridge Parkway, there will be traffic calming for pedestrian and bicycle head start. This is achieved through a new crosswalk and left turn traffic calming, adding lead pedestrian bike intervals, 
for pedestrians and new bicycle signals for crossing Ovington Avenue and Bay Ridge Parkway and existing leading pedestrian intervals for pedestrians crossing 7th Avenue. Just to refresh, that's when you see that countdown clock happening. Okay. Another proposal detail is to improve access to the pedestrian bridge at 72nd Street with an improved crosswalk. On Fort Hamilton Parkway from 79th to 84th Streets, there is a proposal for a Southern Bike Route Connect from the proposed protected bike lane on 7th Avenue to the bike lane on Fort Hamilton Parkway south of 84th Street. On 79th Street, they would add plastic bollards to separate vehicle movements, have a painted curb extension to shorten the pedestrian crossing, and bicycles would shift from the proposed two-way bike lane to a southbound standard bike lane. Travel lanes would be organized to have a dedicated bicycle lane. At Fort Hamilton Parkway and 83rd Street, they have proposals to reduce U-turns and speeding by adding plastic bollards to separate vehicle movement and add a parking lane stripe to reduce speeding. At 7th Avenue from 65th to 67th Streets, the issue is that there are poor connections across the highway. The wide roadway once again encourages speeding. The Leaf Erickson Park Greenway has no eastbound connection, and bicyclists can connect to bike lanes on 7th Avenue north of 65th Street. The section of detail for this is the triangle between 65th and 67th Streets. And the proposal is for new crosswalks and pedestrian space on the bridge to create safer, shorter pedestrian and bicycle connections. They will remove the turning lane on Eric Place to calm vehicles exiting the highway and separate two eastbound lanes legs of 67th Street with painted curb extensions. They propose to remove a vehicular travel lane on the bridge and add a shared pedestrian bicycle space separated by plastic quick curb. There will be rubber speed bumps to calm traffic and move the parking from the right to the left side in that southbound triangle area opposite that house with the picket fence that we may all be familiar with when you picture that, that area. They will remove four parking spaces on 66th Street and add bike connection to 7th Avenue on the northbound side. In summary, they will make these improvements to improve the safety, reduce speeding, and improve connect connectors. At the meeting, feedback from the committee members, community residents, and district manager Beckman included our concerns about ongoing issues with the supermarket that's at the intersection of 65th Street and 7th Avenue and very dangerous truck traffic in that intersection. We have had ongoing issues with truck traffic and truck unloading at 65th Street and 7th Avenue and they are simply not adhering to the law. We are concerned that this particular spot is not compatible with a curbside bike lane. Also, the intersection of Ovington and 7th Avenue has had known issues of flooding during rainy weather. Changes to this area need to take this into consideration. Additionally, there are concerns regarding these changes and the ability for the buses to make their turns by Ovington and Bay Ridge Parkway. There is concerns for safety by PS 127, and that is supposed to be changing to a no stopping anytime spot by the exit from the highway. It was also noted that although this presentation was up to 84th Street, just a little further down at Fort Hamilton Parkway by 86th Street, there is a turning lane and a bicycle lane in the same spot 
and that is a direct safety concern. The committee met in quorum and made a recommendation to send a letter to DOT expressing these concerns of our committee members and residents. The motion is now before the full board for a vote to send a letter out to DOT outlining our feedback and concerns on this proposal. So do we have any questions or discussion? I wish you all had the map. I know you get email to you. And so I hope that you had uh, the opportunity to look at it. Mm -hmm. Reduce the speed to 25. So uh, what, what they told us was that and Nina's when, here. when they originally reduced the speed limit to 25 miles an hour on um, high aggregate road, they left it higher. And they had they were talking about 67. No, 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 I'm Avenue. Avenue. On 7th on Avenue. Avenue. Because of the access road to the Gowanus, because that is considered an access road, they determined that access roads should have higher speed limits. And they determined that that as a problem, and they were reducing this to 25 to be more consistent. I thought they saw the signs. It says the 40, it goes down to 25. If you, if you access it from the highway, it says 40, then immediately it says 25. Within maybe 50 uh, well, hours? Well, on 7th Avenue, it's more 30 miles an hour. On, on the service road southbound. Well, for the Barrazano Bridge, it's more, it's more 30 miles an hour. And that's going to be reduced to 25. Thank you. Okay. Yes, we have to vote on the letter. Oh, okay. Oh. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank and you. some of those maps are going around? Thank you. Um, once we get the speed cameras in the school zones, um, was there any discussion about how that might also assist the speeding? Because I think that's forthcoming, isn't it? So Lori's question was about, we've all heard that schools are getting cameras, cameras for speeding near school zones. This was not discussed at this particular meeting, but we do believe that any enhancement that we can have do help reduce speeding in and around the school areas and also as this is the, uh, as we said, it's the southbound uh, connector to the highway. If we could reduce the speeds along there, it would certainly help everyone because the cameras may be in front of the school, but these are the corridor streets where students have to cross on their way to schools. Bike lane, um, the addition of the bike lane come the traffic. So in the in the map and the presentation that you have, if you have that with you, right now there are currently three lanes of traffic and a parking lane. So by cutting it from the three lanes for traffic to two lanes for traffic, leaving the parking lane, and then making this a, a barrier buffer will be there and then the two-lane bike traffic would be able to be there. There will be less opportunity for drivers to come cutting across three lanes to help make that speeding maneuvers as they're coming around to get to the highway. Um, Nina, I know you're here. If you wanted to add anything to that, that was it. Okay, thank you. Brian? Bicycle lanes can be protected by what? Just bollards? Jersey barriers. No, Jersey barriers. So those are, are more like the, the concrete kind of things that you might see along the, the highway. Okay. We, we did mention that bollards would be by turning areas, I believe, by streets where they would be turning. Right. Is there any other question? I'm sorry. On 78th and, and 7th, there's the entrance to the parkway. So that, how will that be? So the, the entrance, is the, there won't be any change to the entrance to the parkway. It'll just be 
uh, hoping to make the conditions safer on your route to the parkway. So, um, Nina, the question was specifically that when there's that curve to the entrance to the highway, how would that be affected? Um, hi, my name is Nina Heyman. I'm the director of school safety at DOT. Um, the entrance to the highway is 79th Street. So the, the Jersey barrier protected bike lane would come up to 79th and then it would stop. Mm -hmm. So if you were a vehicle trying to get onto the roadway, you would just drive straight in. The barrier, you wouldn't have to go past the barrier. Where is the bike lane? The bike lane the bike lane's on the highway side of 7th Avenue. And then when you get to 79th Street, bikes would go over to the other side of the street and continue down. Because 7th Avenue, after you cross 79th Street, becomes like a narrow, wide street. And, and that, will that have a signal for the bicycle? Um, no, they would cross um, sort of like pedestrians to go over. Oh, okay. Okay. Would, would be oh yeah, they would be signaled. Yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah. So when you came, when we had come to that part on 79th Street, you would be adding the plastic bollards to separate vehicle movement, have a painted curb extension to shorten the pedestrian crossing, and bicycles would shift from the proposed two-way bike lane to a southbound standard bike lane. And that's what I had from, from our report. Okay? All right. So we have a motion on the floor. Uh, to send our concerns to, to DOT. Concern. Right. Mm -hmm. oh. Thank you. And seconded. All in favor? Any opposed? Recusals or abstentions? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And then our last item is the review of the SAPO application for St. Mary's Festival on Ridge Boulevard from 81st to 82nd Street on May 19th from 1 p.m. to 7 p.m. Historically, our committee has agreed with our festival applications with the agreement that the organization follow the community board, stand, stip, board 10 stipulations which are given to all applicants. Um, District Manager Beckman actually has the details of the application so that we may vote. Okay, so I'll turn it over to Josephine. Thank you. Since we had such a busy month um, at TNT, I met, um, according to our guidelines, any new festival applications must be presented before the full board. Um, so this was a, a simple festival application that was submitted by St. Mary's Church. Um, they have applied for a SAPO single block festival event ID 46390. The festival date is Sunday, May 19th, 9 a.m. to 7.30 p.m., including setup and breakdown. The festival will take place on Ridge Boulevard between 81st Street and 82nd Street with a full street closure. The required petition signatures according to CB10 um, guidelines was submitted to the district office. The church hopes that the festival will bring the public out to socialize and showcase the historic church, which has recently gone through a major refurbishment. There will be amplified sound and a sound permit application will be submitted. There will be three small tents, food and beverages will be served. There will be inflatable rides and uh, carnival games. I met with the applicant Christopher Ateneos and he and the parishioners of St. Mary's Church are enthusiastic about the festival. They are proud, this is the first time they're doing this. Um, so they are excited and proud of their new renovation to the church and eager to bring the public out to the location to enjoy a fun family day and provide tours of their beautiful church. So um, because it's a new festival application, it does require an action of the board, a vote of the board, so that the district office can submit um, a recommendation to the street activity permit office. So I'll turn it back over to Jane. Or to Dara, maybe. So we need a motion from the floor to Joe Sokolowski, a second. Barbara Jermak, thank you. Um, any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions, recusals? Thank you, motion carried. It, uh, thank you very much. And now we move on to senior issues, housing, health, and welfare. Thank you.
Good evening. Um, this is a report, an informational report from the Senior Issues Housing, Health and Welfare Committee, which convened on March 21st at 7 p.m. After introductions, licensed clinical social worker Rosa Shripa, clinical director of the Resource Counseling and Training Center, gave a presentation. The Resource Center, as it is office ref often referred to, is a nonprofit New York State Office of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse licensed outpatient, mental, outpatient chemical dependency treatment center, short known as OASIS. Um, this program has two locations. One is in Sunset Park at 39th Street, and the other is within Community Board 10 at 408 77th Street. With the motto of treatment on demand, the Resource Counseling and Training Center empowers chemically dependent individuals to achieve their full potential by delivering community-based substance abuse treatment services that concentrate on mental, physical, and emotional recovery for those individuals and their families. At the Sunset Park location, uh, they have an intensive uh, DWI program with Spanish-speaking counselors. Uh, they serve all of Brooklyn, Queens, and in Staten Island through a program known as Christopher's Reason. Um, there they provide direct services and refer people to other addiction treatment services as needed. <clears throat> Clients, self-referred or referred by others, are often given appointments on the day they call, and timely progress reports are made to referral sources. Um, the number for the Bay Ridge office is 718. 833-3320. District Manager Josephine Beckman shared the long history of working with founder Donna May to address the needs of the community. Um, so for more information about the Resource Center, you can call them or go to their website, which is simply www.resourcetraining.org. The second presentation was um, by Annika Allen and Shannon Henry, both from OHEL Geriatric Project, HEAL, H-E-A-L. Um, they spoke to those present about a free short-term in-home mental health service for older adults with depression. Social workers and mental health counselors under the supervision of a psychiatrist assess the, pa the client's depression using the PHQ-9 screening tool. If scoring indicates services, which are available in a wide range of languages, are offered, this free short-term solution-focused treatment is provided in up to eight sessions over the course of five or six months. Um, they also gave us a phone number for information that is 347-578-0817, and there website is ohelfamily.org. That's spelled O-H-E-L family.org. Uh, lastly, District Manager Josephine Beckman gave a brief presentation about the upcoming Community Board 10 Resource Fair, um, which she spoke briefly about earlier this evening. It will be held on Tuesday, April 30th from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. at the Fort Hamilton Senior Center. The fair will feature city agencies and many organizations that serve our adults. Um, there will be distribution of new resource that features 53 participating businesses offering senior discounts. Um, and all of this really is a product of the age-friendly initiative. Um, leaders of that initiative, Judith Grimaldi, Mary Nicolosi, and T Ted Feldner were all present at the committee meeting. Um, the meeting adjourned at 8 p.m. We're respectfully submitted. Thank you. And um, Eric Kumar from District Attorney Gonzalez's office has joined us. If you'd like to speak a minute. Good evening, Eric Kumar from District Attorney Eric Gonzalez's office. On behalf of the DA and the staff brings you the greetings. And I just brought our justice news. I put some up there, please take it. This is our weekly uh, uh, monthly or uh, newsletter 
and it highlights all of our recent indictments and initiatives we're taking. We also have an email system, and if you guys want to be more informed of the recent cases or the initiative we're taking, you can see me and I can take down your email address and we can put it on that. And on average, you'll get five to seven emails a week uh, with the stuff what's going on and, you know, and what we're doing. Thank you. I, I would just like to uh, make one comment. Um, this board had been active uh, in working with the DA's office on um, human trafficking, sex trafficking. Um, and this has come, it's become more of a nation, nationwide issue now. And some of the pipelines run through New York and Brooklyn. Um, we would like to know more about what, what, what the current, uh, current things that the DA of, DA's office is doing on this. You can come back to this on the you can. Sure. So one more thing. On the back of this, we, we have one of, the, one of the main initial main focus units. We have phone number direct with them. One of them is the Human Trafficking Bureau. So we have a unit which is dedicated to the human trafficking. And it's not only what we classify as only people who, who victims are used for sex trafficking, but also uh, they are undocumented mm -hmm. uh, residents. New York City, where they've been paid way below the minimum wage, and they've been taken to either to Long Island, to Jersey, or other parts of the other parts of the city, or other state, have been used as a daily laborers, and all that, and paid like I said, probably like two to four dollars an hour. So we have a special unit dedicated for that. We have our detention center. The, the way it works is, if you believe there are residents or constituents. You can reach me, or you can call the DA's Action Center, put a formal complaint to get assigned to an investigator in that unit, and that unit will reach out to the victim. And the one thing is which we have it is we don't ask for their document status, whether they are documented, undocumented, if they're on a temporary, or they're on asylum. We don't care. As long as they have a valid complaint, <coughs> valid complaint, and no. Sex trafficking. Um, we all hear in the news. We all often can have made numerous indictments where um, teenagers, especially the teenagers, have been lured into these kind of situations. And we take that very, very seriously. Uh, we, we take them to the fullest extent of the law. DA Gonzalez and our entire team is very, very serious about that. Please, uh, we have the number. Please ask for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any old business? Any new business? Uh, but, uh, um, it, it is, it is, um, we're going into um, Easter and Passover, uh, a time of reflection and renewal, and I wish everyone happy holidays, and do I have a motion to adjourn? Oh, do I have a lot of motions to adjourn? Do I have some seconds? Thank you. Good night, everyone. See you soon. Thank you.